Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk today, where I will have been asked by Matt to speak to you under the general theme of science and shackled. As I am a geoscientist, though, I will be focusing on the more specific theme of geoscience unshackled. In my talk, I will be introducing a revolutionary new insight into geoscience called expansion tectonics. Tectonics relates to the geological processes that control the structure and properties of the surface of the earth and the way the crusts formed, changed, moved and deformed through time. And as most geologists would appreciate, the tectonic history of our Earth is preserved in the rocks all around us and displayed as observable geology. Both plate tectonics and expansion tectonics are scientific theories based on identical global observational data. And both theories recognise that the Earth's crusts comprise several large tectonic plates, which have been slowly moving and deforming since about 3.4 billion years ago. The primary difference between these two theories is what assumptions you adopt in order to make use of this observational data. The uh, uh, plate tectonic theory builds on the historical continental drift theory. Continental drift theory was developed but initially rejected during the first decade of the 20th century. And its primary, although undisclosed, assumption is that Earth radius has remained constant throughout time. This assumption, made at a time when it was not possible to quantify any change in Earth radius, contrasts strongly with expansion tectonics, where no assumptions are made about the size of the Earth and modern geology is allowed to tell its own story. My presentation today is based on 25 years of PhD and post-PhD research. This research has culminated in publication of several books, the latest of which is called Beyond Plate Tectonics, Unsettling Settled Science. Today, I will be focusing specifically on modern geological mapping of the seafloor and continental crustal plates in order to present spherical scale models of the ancient Earth, extending from the present day back to the early Archean. Models created during my research are summarised on screen. And for those not familiar with this research who are invited to download a free PDF copy of my current book from book.expansiontectonics.com. A total of 24 small Earth models were created during my research, extending from the early Archean, shown at far, le uh, far left, to the present day, shown at right plus one model extrapolated to 5 million years into the future. On these models, breakup of the, of the Pangaea supercontinent occurred during the late Permian period, some 250 million years ago, giving rise to formation of the modern continents plus draining of the ancient seas to form the modern oceans. Based on these small Earth models, a selection of additional global observational data will also be presented to further quantify the outcomes of this study. Unbeknownst to most people, conventional plate tectonics, tectonic theory is governed by the most fundamental of assumptions, which insists that Earth radius and hence its mass and surface area have remained constant or near constant since the Earth was first formed some 4.5 billion years ago. 60 years ago, science was perfectly justified in making this assumption, as well as rejecting the alternative expanding Earth theory in favour of the new age constant Earth radius plate tectonic theory. The reason why plate tectonics was adopted during the mid-1960s was because, having just convinced science that continents could indeed move over time, it was a quantum leap in faith to then expect these same scientists to further contemplate that Earth radius could also increase over time. In essence, scientists rejected an increasing radius Earth scenario and instead erred towards simply trusting their gut instinct rather than resorting to good science. And forever after, it has been assumed that Earth radius has been constant over time. 
By, contra by constraining Earth radius to a constant value, the unforeseen outcome of this assumption is that all subsequent assumptions, models, research and theses based on evidence gathered about the Earth are also constrained to a constant Earth model. If this most fundamental assumption about Earth radius is shown to be wrong, then it stands to reason that all subsequent models and theories are also wrong, and hence plate tectonics must be wrong. Since plate tectonics was first introduced during the mid-1960s, a vast amount of global data has been gathered about the Earth, and as students, interested persons or scientists alike, the task in life is to record and interpret this data in an unbiased professional manner. This modern global observational data is factual evidence and ranges from tectonic data, ga data gathered by the, each of the geosciences through to data about the oceans, biological sciences, atmospheric and climate related sciences, space-based science and so on. The point being made here is that utilisation of this data, in particular the mathematical based geophysical and geodetic data, is unconsciously constrained to a constant Earth radius premise. At no point has mainstream science outside the constant Earth paradox to allow or encourage this data to tell its own story. A typical plate tectonic assemblage for the Pangaea supercontinent is shown at left, at the same scale as the middle present day Earth, where the Atlantic Ocean is shown closed at the expense of all other oceans, using a constant radius Earth premise. This animation will move forward in time, simulating breakup of Pangaea to assemble the modern continents and generate new seafloor crusts. The dark grey patterned areas represent known new seafloor crusts surrounding the white areas, which represent inferred pre-existing crusts. On a modern day Earth, these white seafloor crusts do not exist and on a plate tectonic model are required to have been subducted and recycled back into the mantle during the past 200 million years or so. This plate tectonic assemblage is based on the strict assumption that the radius of the Earth and hence its surface area have remained constant throughout time. From this assumption, we are then told that past assemblages of, of crustal fragments are a random, non-predictable and cyclical process of plate collision, assemblage, breakup and dispersal. Herein begs the most fundamental of tests which modern science is reluctant to carry out, let alone recognise. If these random crustal fragments fail to reassemble precisely to enclose the entire Earth on a smaller radius Earth model, then plate tectonics must be correct. However, if these continental crustal fragments do assemble on a smaller radius Earth model to completely cover the entire ancient Earth, then plate tectonics must be wrong. I encourage you to think about this statement. In contrast to the previous plate tectonic model, the expansion tectonic model shown at right was constructed by simply removing the constant radius Earth insistence and allowing modern seafloor geological mapping to constrain and, and assemble the plates back to the Triassic period at about 200 million years ago. On this animation, the globe will rotate once before removing each coloured stripe in, in turn and assembling the remaining plates on a reduced radius model. On the expansion tectonic assembly shown, you will note that all plates assemble precisely to enclose the ancient Earth with continental crust. Hence, plate tectonics must indeed be wrong. On this model, there is no requirement for random, non-predictable crustal assemblages, nor for the presence of pre-existing seafloor crusts, subduction, or arbitrary fragmentation of the continents. In contrast, as mentioned, all continental and seafloor crustal plates are shown to assemble precisely with a better than 99% fit on smaller radius Earth models. These assemblages are, assemblages are shown to be predictable and evolutionary process involving an exponential increase in Earth's surface area and radius over time. This simple test alone, using modern continental and seafloor geological mapping, published well after plate tectonics was formally introduced, tells us that there is something 
seriously amiss with plate tectonics, which must be further investigated. Before we start, without getting into complicated technical detail, what is shown here is a thin section slide of the volcanic rock called basalt, as seen under a microscope and magnified about 600 times. The reason why I'm showing this is because since mapping of the seafloors began during the late 1950s to late 1980s, we now know that the rocks beneath all of the oceans are made up of, up of this same volcanic lava, not drowned continental rocks as was previously thought. What I want to show you is the small black mineral grains highlighted here in yellow called magnetite. Magnetite is a common accessory mineral in basalt and has the very special pro property that it is magnetic. It also has the property that when the volcanic lava cools and solidifies, these magnetized grains align themselves to the prevailing magnetic field existing at the time. We now live in an age where we can drill into the seabed and retrieve samples of this lava. Using a sensitive instrument called a magnetometer, we can also make accurate measurements on the orientation of the ancient magnetism present, which will tell us three things. Firstly, it, would it will tell us which way the ancient north and south pole was orientated. Secondly, it will give us a direction to the ancient magnetic pole. And thirdly, it will enable us to calculate the ancient latitude of the sample site. From this, we can then establish where the ancient north and south poles were, plus establish where the sample site was located north or south of the ancient equator. Modern plate tectonics uses this data to, to generate apparent polar wander paths in order to constrain assemblage of the ancient continents and supercontinents. In contrast, expansion tectonics only needs to use this data to locate the ancient poles and equator for each model constructed. During the, during the late 1940s to 1950s, scientists using sensitive magnetometers adapted from airborne devices developed during World War II to de detect submarines began to recognize strange magnetic patterns across the seafloor. This finding, though unexpected, was not entirely surprising because it, because it is known that basalt the volcanic rock making up the seafloor crust contains the iron-rich mineral magnetite, which can locally distort compass readings. More importantly, because the presence of magnetite gives the basalt measurable magnetic properties, these newly discovered magnetic patterns provide an important means to study the distribution of intruded volcanic rocks throughout each of the oceans. As more and more of the seafloors were mapped during the 1950s to 1980s, these magnetic patterns turned out to be not random or isolated occurrences, but instead revealed a, revealed a predictable zebra stripe-like pattern, as shown schematically at left. These magnetic stripes were found to be symmetrical about centrally located mid-ocean ridges within each of the oceans. From this mapping, alternative st stripes of magnetised basaltic rock were shown to be laid out in parallel rows on either side of the mid-ocean ridge, where one stripe showed a normal magnetic polarity and the adjoining stripe showed a reverse polarity. This overall magnetic pattern, as defined by these alternate, alternating bands of normal and reverse polarised rock, then gave rise to the concept of C4 spreading, schematically shown at right. In 1961, scientists began to theorise that the mid-ocean ridges mark structurally weak zones, where the seafloor was considered as being ripped apart lengthwise along the crest of the mid-ocean ridges. From this observation, it was suggested that new volcanic lava from deep within the earth must rise through these structurally weak zones to eventually erupt along the crest of the ridges and be quenched by the seawater to form new seafloor crust. At or near the crest of the mid-ocean ridges, the seafloor crustal rocks were shown to be very young, and these rocks became progressively older when moving away from the ridge crests. The youngest rocks at the ridge crests always have a present day normal magnetic polarity. Moving away from the ridge crests, the stripes of rock parallel to the ridges were shown to have alternated in magnetic polar polarity from normal to reverse to normal and so on. It was further appreciated from dating the ages of the various seafloor rocks that this process has operated over many millions of years. 
Subsequent mapping has shown that this process is continuing to form new seafloor crust along the entire 65,000 kilometre long system of the centrally located mid-ocean ridges now known to be present throughout all oceans. This seafloor mapping is now universally accepted as representing a natural tape recording of both a history of reversals in the Earth's magnetic field and a history of opening of each of the oceans. A consequence of this observation of seafloor spreading is that new volcanic lava is shown to be continually intruded along the full length of all mid-ocean ridge spreading ridges located within each of the oceans. By dating the ages of samples of rock collected from the seafloor at regular intervals across the bottom of each of the oceans, and by comparing these ages with the magnetic striping, the seafloor crust shown on the magnetic map can then be summarised as intervals of geological time. Shown here is the completed geological map of the world as first published by the Commission for the Geological Map of the World and UNESCO in 1990. This map is based on an extensive program of seafloor magnetic and bathymetric mapping accompanied by age dating carried out through all the oceans during the 1950s to late, late 1980s. The colours shown on this map represent what I call time-dependent geology, where the coloured seafloor stripes, for example, represent the preserved growth history of each of the modern plates as lava is intruded along each of the mid-ocean ridge spreading zones, increasing in width, width by several centimetres per year. For those not familiar with the term plates, this mapping confirms that the Earth's crust is arranged into a series of seven or eight major and several minor plates. The outer edges of each of these plates currently coincide with the pink stripes shown in the middle of each of the oceans. These plates are made up of both continental and seafloor crustal rocks and are generally centred over each of the oceans. The ages of each coloured stripe coincide with the major geological periods and epochs, extending from the youngest pink Pleistocene stripes located along the mid-ocean ridges through to the oldest blue Jurassic stripes generally located adjacent to the continents. What this means is that the yellow seafloor stripes, for example, located between the younger red stripes and the older orange stripes, represent lava that was progressively intruded along the ancient mid-ocean ridge spreading zones during the Miocene period, extending in time from 5.3 to 23 million years ago. During that time, the younger red and pink rocks, respectively, did not exist. During the Miocene, the two adjacent yellow stripes were joined together throughout all the oceans and remain joined along their common mid-ocean ridges during this interval of the time, progressively widening over time. Similarly, the colours within each of the continents represent rocks that were formed during the major geological periods and eras and coincide with the distribution of ancient cratons, shown as areas of pinks and reds, origins, shown as khaki-coloured areas, and basins, shown as browns, blues and yellows. It is unfortunate this mapping is rarely, if ever, used in plate tectonic studies. Why? Because the evidence shown on this map does not support the basic concepts of plate tectonics. This mapping clearly defines the presence and distribution of each of the plate boundaries over the past 200 million years. However, plate tectonics is portrayed as a random plate generation pro process and hence, in theory, the distribution and, and arrangement of these plates should be more random and disoriented than what is clearly shown. A good analogy for the seafloor stripe shown here is growth rings on a tree. For most, most trees, a new growth ring is added around the perimeter of the trunk or branch for each year of growth. <clears throat> on Earth, as you move forward in time, new lava is added around the perimeter of each of the plates along the entire length of the mid-ocean ridges. As a result, each stripe progressively increases in width, each ocean increases in surface area, and each of the continents moves further apart, as per the red, red arrows, scaled to show 1 to 14 centimetres increase per year. By the time this modern mapping was published in 1990, plate tectonics was firmly established in science, and geoscientists were committed to supporting the long-standing assumption 
that the surface area of the Earth has remained constant over time. It would seem that, just like Darwin and Copern Copernicus had to face centuries ago, any devi deviation from established assumption, irrespective of new evidence, must be met with derision and rejection or simply ignored. Putting aside any preconceived theories or assumptions about what the Earth should or should not be doing, from this mapping, it is logical to conclude that when moving back in time, the intruded lava, along with a proportion of water and atmospheric gases, must be returned to the mantle from where they came from. In doing this, the surface area of each of the oceans must then progressively reduce. Similarly, each of the continents must move closer together in accordance with this preserved plate history in the direction shown by the magenta arrows. Herein lies a dilemma. In order to satisfy this requirement, do we retain plate theory and assume that the surface area of the Earth is constant, or do we allow the modern mapping evidence to tell its own story? In this animation, the geological map of the world is shown in spherical format. The globe will rotate a few times before removing each coloured seafloor stripe in succession along each of the mid-ocean ridge spreading zones, simulating moving back in time. What I have done in this animation is to simply remove each coloured stripe in turn without forcing the mapping into a, into a preconceived Atlantic Ocean assemblage as currently adopted by plate tectonics. By doing this, the mapping highlights that in addition to closing off the Atlantic Ocean, each of the other oceans can just as easily be closed off along their respective mid-ocean ridge spreading zones. And each adjoining continent can also just as easily be moved closer together. The point we made here is that forcing this mapping into a preconceived Atlantic Ocean assemblage is based on a 1960s assumption that Earth radius and surface area has always been constant. So why hasn't this new revelation been tested? In contrast to constraining the mapping to only closing off the Atlantic Ocean, in this next animation, the model will rotate once before removing each coloured seafloor stripe in turn and reassembling the remaining plates together on smaller radius Earth models. As can be appreciated, this represents a unique but seemingly highly contentious method of modelling and constraining this readily available mapping data. This animation simulates returning the intruded lava as well as a proportion of the atmospheric gases and seawater from each of the oceans back to the mantle from where they originally came from. By doing this, each of the continents are then moved closer together, in effect, reverse engineering the preserved plate growth history back in time. As can be readily seen in this animation, the remaining plates assembled together on each successive model with a single unique plate fit estimated to be better than 99% fit. You will also note that each model has a north and south pole, along with an equator scaled from these pole locations. These poles were plotted directly from the International Paleopole database, where each of the published poles plot as diametrically opposed north and south magnetic poles for each model, as they should do. On these models, by the Triassic period, some 200 million years ago, continental and marine sedimentary basins begin to merge to form a global network of basins, coinciding with relatively shallow continental seas. These sedimentary basins, shown as white on each model, represent a network of low-lying regions where the sediment eroded from the exposed land surfaces accumulates. Logic dictates that by moving further back in time, this erosion process must be reversed and all young sediments must be progressively returned to their former land surfaces. By returning these sediments to their former land surfaces, it is then feasible for the size of the ancient earth to be further reduced back in time and older continental crust more tightly assembled on pre-Triassic models. By continuing to model back in time to the late Permian period, 
about 250 million years ago. On this model, all young seafloor crust plus most of the marine sediments deposited along the continental shelves have been removed. The distribution of published ancient continental seas are also shown in blue and the modern continental outlines are highlighted as black dashed lines. As distinct from conventional practice, what is shown on this model is that all continental crusts unite precisely with a single unique plate fit to form a global supercontinent during the late Permian period around 250 million years ago at around 50% of the present Earth radius. Each of my models also show that large ancient Panthalassa, Tethys and Iapetus oceans are not required during model construction. These oceans are instead replaced by continental Panthalassa, Iapetus and Tethys seas, which represent precursors for modern Pacific and Atlantic oceans, as well as ancient sedimentary basin, basins located on many of the present day continents. On the post-Permian models, the transition from ancient seas to modern oceans only came about when the Pangaea supercontinent, shown here, first started to rupture and break up to form the modern continents and the intervening modern oceans. It is envisaged that breakup then initiated draining of waters from the ancient seas into the newly opening modern oceans, plus expul expulsion of new waters and gases from along the newly formed mid-ocean ridge spreading zones. The preliminary conclusions drawn from these models is that there is no requirement for random, non-predictable, multiple plate fit assemblage options or ill-defined plate histories as currently promoted in plate tectonics. Nor, nor is there a requirement for extensive, largely hypothetical ancient oceans to co comply with the constant surface area premise or for the fragmentation of any of the modern continents to comply with ancient magnetic pole studies. Instead, it is shown that the ancient continents tightly wrap around and fully enclose an ancient, smaller radius, Pangaea supercontinental Earth. A quick digression to highlight currently available plate tectonic assemblages using conventional plate tectonic or plate magnetic wisdom. Shown here are 11 published assemblages for the Precambrian Rodinia supercontinent at around 1,000 million years ago, which is based on the assumption that plate motion across the face of the Earth is a random process whereby, super, whereby supercontinents break up, move around, collide, and reassemble in a roughly cyclical time frame on a constant radius Earth. A number of these assemblages were done by the Tectonic Special Research Group run by the University of Western Australia, Curtin University, and the University of Austin, Texas, while I was also researching independently at Curtin University. This was at a cost of a number of million dollars per, <coughs> per um, assemblage to produce. These 11 completely different plate assemblages for the same supercontinent are governed entirely by the ancient magnetic apparent polar wonder studies generated by the various authors. And the multitude of assemblages are literally at the whim of each author. The point I am emphasizing here is to assemble all of these randomly generated continental fragments on a smaller radius Earth should, in theory, be an impossible task. So let us see what the modern geological mapping enables us to do. From the seafloor modelling study, my models show that the ancient supercontinents existed as a complete continental shell encompassing the entire Earth during the pre-Permian times at a much reduced Earth radius. During the pre-Permian times, continental crust covered the entire Earth and exposed supercontinents were defined by a network of continental seas coinciding with a network of sedimentary basins. These seas are not show, <coughs> shown on this animation, only the crustal geology. Construction of small earth models back to the early Archean, some 4,000 million years ago, involves a radical approach to reverse engineering geology back in time. This approach focuses primarily on the established network of sedimentary basins, which surround each of the ancient cratonic and orogenic crusts. For your information, a craton is defined as rocks older than 2,000 
400 million years old. An origin refers to a belt of ancient rocks characterized by folding, metamorphism, and intrusion, intrusion of magmatic rocks, such as granites. And a basin refers, refers to an area that is underlain by a substantial thickness of sedimentary rocks. Modeling back in time involves the progressive removal of all young sediments and intruded rocks, such as granite and lava, and simply returning these rocks to the ancient lands or back to the mantle where they came from. Each basin is then restored to a pre-extension or pre-intrusion configuration on a smaller model. By moving back in time, the adjacent margins of each basin is then progressively moved closer together while still preserving the integrity of adjacent, more ancient crusts. When moving forward in time, all rocks making up the ancient supercontinents and seas are then shown to retain an intimate relationship throughout history. This intimate relationship lasted un until crustal breakup was initiated during the late Permian, approximately 250 million years ago, and the modern oceans began to open. From this modelling study, it is shown that the changing configuration of these supercontinents during these times involved a progressive evolutionary process during a prolonged period of crustal stretching, along with changes to both Earth's surface area and surface curvature through time. As previously mentioned, in contrast to constraining the geological mapping to only closing off the Atlantic Ocean, in this animation, the models will start from the early Archean, some 4,000 million years ago, and will again rotate once before progressively moving forward in time to the present day, showing the entire 4 billion years of Earth history. It is significant to ignite, again note that on these models, each of the ancient sedimentary basin settings were merged together to form a global network. Studies elsewhere also show that the basins from each of the continents also coincide with a global network of crustal weakness operating throughout ancient times. It was within this network of global weakness that crustal extension generated during ongoing increase in Earth radius and surface area was focused, as well as ongoing crustal movement, mantle heat flow, magmatic and metal generating activity, followed by crustal rupture, continental breakup, and eventual open of each of the modern oceans. The merging of each of these crustal settings back in time shows that all crustal related processes correlate precisely with the overall development of the continental crusts. What the full range of Archean to present day models also demonstrate is that rather than being a random, arbitrary amalgamation, dispersal, amalgamation crustal process, as we are currently led to believe, Crustal development on an increasing radius Earth is once again shown to be a simple, evolving and predictable process. We are now in a position to use these models as a platform to drape modern global data in order to both test the validity of these models and to investigate the distribution of these data fields over time. Applying this modelling evidence to ancient magnetic studies shows that all magnetic poles cluster as unique diametrically opposed north and south poles, as they should, and similarly plotted ancient latitude measurements coincide with and quantify the location of predicted equator and climate zones on each model constructed. Additional geographical and climate-related information aptly quantify the location of these ancient magnetic poles, equators and climate zones, as determined from magnetic pole and latitudinal data. <coughs> When published coastal geography is plotted on each of the models, the geography defines the presence of more restricted continental path Panthalassa, Iapetus and Tethy seas, which represent precursors to the modern Pacific and Atlantic oceans and the emergent Eurasian continents respectively. From this coastal geography, the coastal outlines and emergent land surfaces on each model is then shown to accurately define the location and extent of the ancient Rodinia, Gondwana, and Pangaea supercontinents and smaller subcontinents. As can be seen on screen, we are also in a unique position to extrapolate modelling forward in time, in this case, to 5 million years into the future. 
at 5 million years in the future, the configuration of continents and oceans is shown to be much the same as at present, albeit at a slightly larger Earth radius and surface area. Shown here is the assemblage of the most ancient continental crusts on what I refer to as the primordial Archean supercontinent. Each of the ancient continental crusts are highlighted and named. On all pre-Triassic models, it is reiterated that the ancient crusts existed as a complete continental crustal shell encompassing the entire Earth. During this modelling study, in contrast to the 11 plate tectonic assemblages previously shown, plate assemblages were achieved with only plat one plate fit option. Prior to the early Triassic times, exposed supercontinental lands were simply defined by a network of continental seas coinciding with sedimentary basins, shown on this model as khaki-coloured terrains. This supercontinental phase lasted for around 3,750 million years and culminated during breakup of the late Permian-Pangaea supercontinent approximately 250 million years ago. The primordial Archean to mid Proterozoic supercontinental assemblage is shown here at around 1,600 million years ago along with the ancient equator and poles located using published magnetic pole data. The named remnants of the present-day modern continents are also highlighted as black outlines. <clears throat> this, modern, this model represents assemblage of the most ancient continental crusts that, that are currently preserved on the present-day Earth. On this Archean model, all young sedimentary rocks intruded and extruded volcanic and magnetic rocks as well as any young orogenic rocks have simply been returned back to the exposed lands or mantle from where they came from. We then end up with an assemblage of the most ancient Precambrian rocks on a primordial earth at approximately 27% of the present earth radius, much the same size as the present day moon. During these early times, it is envisaged that once the primitive crusts had cooled and stabilized, any increase in Earth's size would initiate global cracking and fracturing of the crust, local, localized primarily within a network of orogenic activity and crustal weakness. It is envisaged that during this cracking phase, the network of crustal weakness and fracturing was also intruded by the renewed granite activity and intrusion of primitive volcanic lava. The tonalite, trondromite, granite diorite group of Granite rocks common to all Archean trains throughout the world may be related to this event. During the latter part of this early supercontinental phase, sedimentary basins were slowly fin filling to capacity over the extremely long period of time operative during these ancient times. These geological changes then e evolved imperceptibly into the better known Rodinia supercontinent. Rodinia is presented here on the late Proterozoic Small Earth model at around 800 million years ago. The assemblage and distribution of the remnant modern continental outlines are again shown as black outlines, along with the ancient magnetic poles and equator. The Proterozoic, in particular, is characterised by the presence of very large, stable sedimentary basins, forming rel relatively shallow seas with a low elevation contrast between the drylands and the seas, shown as khaki-coloured areas. A distinguishing feature of the Proterozoic times was also the changing atmospheric conditions. These conditions changed from reducing conditions throughout much of the earlier Archean time to an increase in, in atmospheric oxygen during the Proterozoic. This transition was marked by an increasing accumulation of banded iron formation rocks and chemically precipitated silica and calcium and magnetic magnesium carbonate rocks. During these extended Precambrian times, the ancient North and South Poles were located in what are the now Northern China and West Africa respectively. Similarly, the ancient equator passed through what is now North America, East Antarctica, Australia, Greenland and Scandinavia. As can be seen from both their previous Archean and Rodinia small Earth models, the change from one supercontinent to another was progressive and evolutionary, and this theme will continue to follow through to the following Gondwana and Pangaea supercontinents. 
Gondwana is shown here reconstructed on the Ordovician small earth model at around 460 million years ago. In this figure, the distributions of ancient continental seas plotted from published coastal data are also shown as shaded blue areas and the various ancient seas and supercontinents are named. On small earth models during Gondwanan times, the earth was undergoing a steady to rapid increase in size and surface area and was also fast approaching crustal rupture and breakup. The Gondwana assemblage retains the same configuration of cratons, origins and basins as seen on the earlier Rodinia and Archean supercontinents. The only difference being the greater surface area of the surrounding sedimentary basins and hence aerial distribution of continental seas. This crustal assemblage is retained still further in time until the initiation of crustal rupture and breakup of the continental crust during the late Permian at around 250 million years ago. The coastal information on this model shows that there were distinct elevated, elevated ancient land surfaces which are represented by the various supercontinents shown. These land surfaces were in turn surrounded by a network of equally distinct, relatively shallow continental seas. During the Gondwanan times, the South Pole was still located within central West Africa in what was then South Gondwana. The North Pole was also located within northern China in what was part of the Tethy Sea. The ancient equator passed through East Antarctica, Central Australia, North America, Central Eurasia and India through what was then North Gondwana. The late Paleozoic to early Mesozoic times coincided with breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent and was accompanied by draining of the continental Tethys, Panthalassa and Iapetus seas as the modern oceans began to open. As a result of draining of these seas, each of the Gondwana and related supercontinents geographically merged with the smaller Laurentia, Baltica and Laurentia subcontinents to form the more familiar Pangaea supercontinent, shown here on the Permian Small Earth model at 250 million years ago. This figure again shows the continental seas as shaded blue areas and the various supercontinents and intervening seas existing at the time are also named. This Pangaea assemblage coincides with a time when increasing Earth's surface area had progressed from advanced continental extension to crustal rupture prior to crustal breakup and dispersal of the modern continents. Following rupture of the supercontinental crust, Pangaea eventually broke up during the late Permian and dispersed as the modern continents during the Triassic to present day times. This post-Pangaea interval, interval of time also saw, saw large apparent shifts in the location of the North and South Poles and Equator, occurring as a direct result of opening of the modern continents. On an increasing radius Earth, until about 250 million years ago, there were no modern oceans, only ancient continental seas. During that time, ancient continental crust existed as a complete shell encompassing the entire ancient Earth. The outlines and configuration of the exposed lands making up the supercontinents were then dictated by the presence of and changes to these ancient seas. The transition from ancient seas to modern oceans only came about when the Pangaea supercontinent first started to rupture and break up 250 million years ago. It was this breakup of Pangaea that finally established the modern continents and intervening modern oceans, as well as initiating draining of, of waters from the ancient seas into the newly opened oceans. Modelling shows that the volume of ocean water has also been increasing steadily since Archean times, and most prominently since crustal breakup and opening of the modern oceans. It is suggested that this increase in volume of water occurred in conjunction with intrusion of new volcanic crust along the newly established network of mid-ocean reach spreading zones. This new water, plus accompanying atmospheric gases, is inferred to represent the escape of volatile elements which occur, occur naturally within the crystal lattices of all molten volcanic rocks. Com complicating this process is that major changes in sea levels also occurred during merging of two or more ancient continental seas, during breakup of the ancient supercontinents 
and opening of each of the modern oceans. Major changes in sea levels then represent a realistic mechanism for periods of mass extinction of ancient plant and animal species. Ancient magnetics is used in plate tectonic studies to establish an apparent polar wander path for each crust or fragment in order to constrain positioning of the fragmented crusts during assemblage. The modelling study presented here does not generate apparent polar wander paths and hence does not rely on ancient magnetic to, to constrain assemblage of the ancient crusts. This modelling study is a in, instead governed solely by geology. The locations of present day to Archean magnetic poles, shown here on each of the models, were located using data from the International Paleomagnetic Database of McAleeny and Locke, 1996. These poles extend from the Archean some 4,000 million years ago to the present day, plus one model extrapolated to 5 million years into the future. Plotting this data on each model consistently shows that approximately 95% of the pole, pole data plot within 25 degrees radius of each magnetic pole and south pole location. It is significant to note that the distribution of mean north and south poles plotted independently on each model show that each pole plots as diametrically opposed north and south poles with no requirement for apparent polar wander as they should do. The magnetic pole data is shown here located in northern China and it remained there throughout Precambrian and into early Paleozoic times as shown on the top row of models. As the Pangaea supercontinent ruptured during the late Permian and the various northern continents slowly migrated south, the distribution of North Pole locations shows there was then an apparent northward migration of the magnetic pole through Siberia to its present location within the present Arctic Ocean. From the established pole and latitude locations, it is then possible to model the expected climate zones for each of the north and south polar regions. This figure shows the ancient North Pole region centred over the ancient North Pole located on each of the models. Also shown is the distribution of known glacial related rocks and formations, shown as red dots, as well as the presence of known ice sheets shaded white. It is significant to note that on these models, the distribution of both glacial related rocks and ice sheets coincide with the highlighted major glacial events, as they should do. The absence of ice sheets over the North Pole during the Ordovician, Carboniferous and Permian periods is shown to be the result of warm tethy sea-related currents circulating from equatorial regions into and across the North Polar region. This North Pole observation is further quantified by the abundance of warm water marine fossil species present throughout the northern Tethy Sea region. Similarly, the magnetic South Pole is shown located in West Central Africa, and it remained there throughout the top row of Precambrian and Paleozoic models. As the Pangaea supercontinent ruptured and the various southern continents slowly mig migrated north, the distribution of South Pole locations shows there was an apparent southward migration of the South Pole along the South American and West African coastlines prior to crossing the opening Atlantic Ocean and moving to its present location in Antarctica, as shown mainly in the middle row of models. In this figure, locations of the ancient South Polar region centred over the ancient South Pole along with glacial related rocks and formations shown as red dots are again shown. By definition, the North and South Polar regions must remain centered over each of the ancient poles. During migration of a continent into or out of a polar region, if conditions are favorable, the leading edge of a continent may establish an ice sheet as it enters a polar region, or the leading edge of an established ice sheet may melt as it moves out of the respective polar region. Similarly, the trailing edge of an existing ice sheet may also freeze and increase in surface area as it moves further into the respective polar region. This is highlighted by the passage of, Ant of Antarctica into the South Polar region during the Cretaceous to present day times, where a permanent continental ice sheet was first established over Antarctica 
33 million years ago. You will also note that during the Ordovician, Carboniferous and Permian times, the South Polar region was located over the exposed Gondwana supercontinent and hence, unlike the North Polar region, had permanent ice sheets during these times. As well as plotting magnetic pole data, ancient latitude can also be plotted from magnetic sample data. This data is unique in that ancient latitude calculated from sample data represents the actual latitude of the ancient sample site and, unlike the magnetic poles, does not require projection beyond the sample site location. Latitude data is shown here plotted on each model, extending from the early Archean to the present day. In this figure, the latitude data is color-coded to represent data located within the north and south equatorial, equatorial climate zones, shown as red dots, the north and south temperate zones, shown as green dots, and the north and south polar regions, shown as blue dots. The climate zone boundaries, shown as dashed yellow lines, are based on boundary distributions on the present day Earth. Considering the increasing uncertainty in structural correction and magnetic screening of sample data when moving back in time, the latitude data for each model shows a very good correlation with each of the climate zones, in particular for the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras, shown in the, shown in the middle and lower rows, respectively. There is an abundance of additional observational data presented in my current book. However, this is all very well, but you have every right to ask, where did all the extra matter come from to increase the mass, radius and surface area of the Earth over time? In providing a causal mechanism for an increase in Earth mass and radius over time, I will now elaborate on new space-based discoveries. Of significance to this research is, is that in year 2000, four identical Cluster 2 satellites were launched by the European Space Agency. These satellites were launched to study the impact of the sun's activity on the near-Earth space environment by flying in formation to gather data around the Earth. For the first time in space history, this mission was able to collect three-dimensional information about how the solar wind interacts with the magnetosphere, how it affects near-Earth space, and how our giant spherical magnet called Earth reacts with particles within the solar wind. This new information and related discoveries were considered by the European Space Agency uh, project scientists to be of great importance because they showed how the Earth's magnetosphere can be penetrated by solar particles. The Earth's magnetosphere is now shown to be full of trapped plasma, comprising charged electron and proton particles, origin originating from the solar wind as it passes the Earth. This flow of plasma into the magnetosphere increases with increase in solar wind density and speed, as well as increases in turbulence in the solar wind. In addition to penetrating the magnetosphere, it has also been shown that the plasma travels down along the Earth's magnetic field lines within the auroral, auroral zones entering the Earth at each of the poles. This European study suggested to the scientists that penetration of plasma may be a lot more common than was previously known and possibly represents a means for the constant flow of charged electrons and protons into the Earth. The most important question that should then come to mind is what happens to these electrons and protons, the very building blocks of all matter in the universe when they enter the Earth? The answer to the question, this question is, of course, that they must increase the mass and radius of the Earth over time. As just mentioned, modern space technology has highlighted the input of solar wind-related charged electrons and protons into the Earth. Shown here is a schematic cross-section of the Earth. On an increasing mass and radius Earth, it is envisaged that mag magnetically charged electrons and protons primarily enter the Earth's lower terrestrial layers at the polar auroral zones. 
<clears throat> these magnetically charged electron and proton ions are further attracted by conduction to the strongly magnetic core mantle region of the Earth. The elevated core mantle temperatures and pressures present enable the, ion, the ions to recombine via nuclear synthesis as new matter within the upper core or lower mantle regions. New matter formation requires not only pure energy, but the presence of both electrons and protons, each of which are in abundance. The combination of elevated core mantle temperatures and the abundance of incoming charge electrons and protons within this region may then provide a, provide a viable mechanism to continuously synthesize new matter within the Earth. It is further envisaged that ma uh, matter synthesis occurs mainly within the reactive upper core to D region of the lower mantle region, which in turn results in increasing in Earth mass. In, in, in addition to an increase in mass, this growth of new matter would cause the mantle to increase in volume. It is envisaged that this increase in volume is currently manifested at the Earth's surface by two primary mechanisms. Firstly, as laterally di directed crustal extension, which is currently occurring as extension focused along the full length of the mid-ocean reed spreading zones. And secondly, as an increase in Earth's surface area manifested initially within continental sedimentary basins and currently within each of the oceans. Extension within the upper mantle and surface crustal regions is highlighted in this figure by the paired red arrows shown at each of the mid-ocean reed spreading zones. This mantle and crustal extension process enables newly formed magna to be squeezed from deep within the earth where it travels by convective flow up to the surface, as indicated by the upward facing magenta colored arrows. The surface, surface expression of this magma and associated high heat flow process is focused along the full length of the centrally located mid-ocean reed spreading zones, as well as leakage along known hotspots volcanic centres and large and small igneous provinces. Extension within the mid-ocean ridge zones is further accompanied by intrusion of mantle-derived lava, along with expulsion of new water and atmospheric gases. This lava, in turn, increases the surface area of all of the modern oceans in strict accordance with the seafloor mapping as shown in the geological map of the world and small earth models presented here. In this presentation, I have tried to emphasize to you that the Earth is a geological entity comprising both continental geology and seafloor geology. If you choose to ignore the 70% of geology preserved in the seafloor crusts, for example, in, pre in preference to using mathematically derived ancient pole locations based on the explicit assumption that Earth radius is constant, then plate tectonics works just fine. By continuing to, to ignore this continental and seafloor geology, plate tectonics is universally accepted as a central and unifying theory of geology. Yet its failure to utilise published geological mapping is inconsistent with required scientific principles. In contrast, the unique assemblage of all continental and seafloor geology on small earth models demonstrates that an increasing radius earth extending 4,000 million years back to the beginning of Earth's geological past is indeed viable. What the full range of Archean to present-day models also demonstrates is that rather than being a random, arbitrary, amalgamation, dispersal, amalgamation, cyclical crustal forming process, as we are currently led to believe, crustal development on an increasing radius Earth is instead shown to be a simple, evolving, and predictable crustal process. And herein lies a problem. No scientist likes to be told they are wrong, especially if they have an international reputation to uphold. So I hope I have convinced you that geoscience does indeed need to be unshackled and plate tectonics desperately needs to be reviewed, rev revised, or simply rejected in favor of an increasing mass and radius earth. Thank you.